I am Jilly Briggs, and I am with Center Stage Magazine, and I am getting to speak with the very talented musician Larry Wimmer this morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm actually uh, staying here this morning, sort of tooling around some of this stuff in my home studio. I, I work at home to work out parts in my own home studio before I take them into the, the, the big studio or the main studio to uh, record so I'm just going to go over some files today. Well, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. You can kind of get up in the morning and have your cup of coffee and just walk, you know, down the, you know, hall to work, you know, for a little bit. That's great. That's it, well, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. Now, I mentioned, you know, that you are a musician, but I didn't mention what type of a musician. Um, we did kind of touch base a little bit before the interview, and you um, you described you're not quite a blues singer. You're not quite a rock singer, but you have kind of like a little bit of your own category as you describe um, a bit of a funkadilly type of sound. Can you explain yeah. to the listeners out there, like, what, what do you mean by, like, that type of, you know, funkadilly sound? What what would you well, explain, like, how you're Yeah, the terminology funkadilly actually came from uh, a, a friend of mine who has come to see me in several shows, and and uh, as it so happened, he was probably a little bit inebriated that day, but he walked up to me and he said, Larry, I know exactly what type of music you play. And I, I was curious to hear the answer. And he said, you play Funkabilly. <laughs> and it, it really struck me as being pretty like, you know, I mean, some people say like Rockabilly or, you know, Cajun or Funk or, you know, they give pretty, pretty straight names for styles. But it kind of threw me for a loop and I really liked it. Um, I thought it gave me the ability to hang my own musical moniker out there as my own individual style, but that really comes from the fact that uh, that you know, growing up, uh, even though I had several siblings who were much older than I was, I was the baby in my family. But at the same time, growing up, I like the Beatles and the Stones and the English Invasion and a lot of the current rock at that time. Um, my older brothers were listening a lot to a lot of uh, roots music uh, at that time, and it was a lot of people like uh, you know, the early Isley Brothers or Little Richard, or, and I sort of developed a fascination with the early R&B, which um, established a lot of how, how, what my style became as a vocalist, because obviously as a, as a seven or eight-year-old child, you don't, you're really not adept at an instrument yet, but you can sing. So I learned all those different styles and, and, and combination with. So I learned pop and rock, and I learned early soul music and R and B, and you know all the artists, Otis Redding, and all that. who were all these older styles of R and B music, and I had so many of those influences that. And, and as I think we talked before, uh, it's it's like it's an it's. You are every one of us is an amalgam of everything that we listen to. We don't really realize yeah. that we are we that we truly are all individual, unique, uh, individually unique because we are an amalgam of all those things that we love. Oh yes, exactly. Yeah. And and well, if, you know, and and you know, for the aspiration for you to be this singer, songwriter, multi instrumentalist that you are today, you know, that's some really great influences to have, you know, behind there. And um, I know you have like a number of CDs out. You have several CDs out with. Um, other artists, other people that are in the industry, and I know you do have, like, several of your own. Um, can you, like, tell us first, like, about, um, like, like who you've worked with and, you know, the CDs that you've, uh, that you've done music with them on and, and your collaboration before we get into the, um, to the individuals, like, you know, who you've been working with the last several years? Um, well, I, I guess in, in, in the past, I, I was working with a lot of people, not so much on their albums, but for like a lot of live gigs and stuff like that, and, okay. and sort of helping other people arrange and stuff. Because from an earlier part of my career, I, I mentored a lot of people, but mainly it was just me wanting to get out and work with other people. I literally, right out of high school, went on the road in a band, and 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 and, uh, and we were playing at that time what would, what would be considered almost like your lounge lizard type of things. But it, it was a formative time for me to really learn what it was like to be on the road, to be to try to be a crowd pleaser at the same time, 
knew at the early stages I, I was just writing stuff, which is just you know, a lot of my friends and associates really couldn't understand. But um, I was very fortunate very early on in my professional career to develop relationships uh, uh, and I can sort of do it chronologically. Um, there's a chance to meet a lot of people who went on to do bigger and better things. But primarily, I worked the hardest at just really getting to understand uh, deep writing styles and, and that. But in the earliest days, I worked uh, a girl that was in our band. Her name was Cass Seba. And, uh, and Cass was early in her career, uh, if you want to talk about a simple twist of fate, uh, and it was a local girl here who played all the hot clubs back in the day. She's sort of a bluesy, folky kind of singer. And she drew the attention of Scott Cameron, who was the, who was also Muddy Waters' manager. Oh, wow. Yeah, he took her under her wing, his wing, and uh, basically nurtured her career. And, um, and at one point we were... Uh, she was talking to, well, they had had meetings for us, and they had met up with uh, people from Electra Asylum Records. And there was a girl there who was named Laura Plotkin, who was the uh, the person who was res- uh, an, an A&R person, you know, person who's responsible for signing new talent or, you know, new products. Oh, okay, okay, yes, yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and, and so they were trying to figure out what to do with her. They knew she was this great talent, and they were trying to pick songs for her to do to cover. And there's a California guy whose name is and I, I'm ashamed to say I don't know if he's still with us or not, but his name is Moon Martin. And he wrote a song called Bad Case of Loving You. And uh, I kind of gave away the secret of the story here early, but basically they were sitting here with three or four songs that they wanted to cast to debut the label. And uh, Scott had said, had picked this particular song the people, Electra, didn't think it was the right choice, but the song ended up being the one that Robert Palmer made so famous called Bad Case of Loving You. And I was going to say, as soon as you said that, everybody knows, you know, that day, but everybody knows, you know, Robert Palmer with the famous video of all the girls, you know, in it and everything. Right, right. That's and awesome. the whole, a simple twist of fate means, you know, I would have had probably had a, a much more magnanimous career had she recorded that. And push aside the bigger and better things, but that's how how fickle fate can be. Oh yeah, uh, life just but, a but, different curve. Yeah, really, yeah. Mm-hmm, but it really didn't uh, it didn't really phase. We kept you know we all kept pushing away, and and uh, how it worked out is that uh, she was also friends with uh, a lady by the name of Rose, who was the I'll try to keep this as simple and uncomplicated as I can. Was her best friend Rose. Cass' best friend, Rose, was married to Dennis Johnson, who was the bass player for Survivor. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I had the Tiger. So, uh, naturally, we got sort of a backdoor hook up there to do some stuff with those guys and, and you know, and do some gigs and whatever. And that led to other things like playing with Cheap Trick and uh, off Broadway, who was more of a regional favorite around here, and different people. But uh, much further down the road, uh, I, you know, move along and then you figure that I I start working more at my own stuff in my own career. It's yeah, and this is when you kind of started doing more, you know, connections in there and, you know, um, to be working with, you know, so many great people in the industry. But, of course, as you said, you want to be able to also have your own individual music out there because, like you right. said, your own funkadilly sound. I mean, something different, right. something people would definitely be, you know, attracted to um, as far as, you know, like, so these are like, when you go into your own music, um, I will have to say I really did love, you know, Sunrise in the in New Orleans song. And okay. it's it's very moving, very soulful, and like I use music for therapy for the moods and stuff, and it was just absolutely beautiful. And I have to admit, I watched the Burning Up video like a bunch of times. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. I, I have to say that uh, that I, if I, I I'm not a person who will pat myself on the back or brag about anything, but uh, when my wife would come and watch me play in a room, and she would say, you know, the one thing she said, you don't realize that you're a storyteller. And and to me that's a big part of what I always try to convey in my music that I uh, I want to grab people's attention not just space because a lot of people can just write a song and there's formula for writing a lot of different styles but uh, primarily when I get on a stage 
I'm trying to communicate and connect with that audience. And my wife would say, we can be in a bar, Larry, and she'll say, and then all of a sudden people are watching you on stage and they're listening to you sing these parts. And the whole room stops and they watch you and they listen to you. And that is the connection that's most important to me is because when I'm speaking those words or telling those stories, that's when you really feel the connection between you and the audience. And that's that's solid gold to me. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, and, and you know what? That's like a perfect analogy. As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, my God, it clicked in my head. It was like, you know what? That That is just makes perfect sense because just – Listening to all your music, it, it is, it, like you said, it, you're telling a story. It's very much very moving, very soulful, but you can hear that there is a story in there. It's like you're talking about something in particular in your life or, you know, something that you wished or whatever, and, and you, you, like, you feel immersed in it, and, and you almost think, oh, God, I, I get that. I totally understand that, what he's talking about. You know, you're going to get the people that connect with it because it does feel a bit of a storyline. It's not just, hey, I met this girl, she's pretty, you know, and I like her, let me write a song. You know, it really does convey a lot of of messages and love and caringness and things like that, and I really did enjoy it, and I think your wife just hit it on the nail. That's, like, a really good analogy of it. And I thought it was amazing. It really was. Like, I was... I was listening to it a lot. I was even telling my husband, you've got to hear this. You've got to hear this. You know, so we were really listening to it a lot, and I'm like, this is just really amazing, and I was looking forward to talking to you because I really felt that this was um, something a lot of people should hear, you know, and, and I do like to hear all the different types of music, all the different genres, and I think yours is, like, really cool. It's got just this really cool sound. You can't help but want to just, kick back and relax and listen to it, you know, so I think that's one. Uh, did you by chance listen to the other uh, video that was on my website by chance? It's called uh, Everything I Need. Yes, I did, actually. Okay. I, actually I went through several of them. I, I went through as much as I possibly could because I, I really yeah. did enjoy the sound, you know, and I like listening to, to music, that even new music I haven't heard before. But it catches me like that. I'm like, I will go through and just keep listening to it. So I did. I did listen to all that also. Yeah, the, the the lyrical content is what always throws people because when they, uh, when I'm saying sometimes she's she's not always everything I want, but sometimes she's everything I need. Yes, and exactly. It's, it's, it's actually about a guitar. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, because the lyric, the lyric line, if you listen carefully, it talks about when she's hanging on my shoulder or when she's sitting on my knee. And uh, so I use these analogies to make it seem like it's a woman. But what's really, uh, I'll, I'll give you the base story of that, the reason why that song got written. Um, I was married before, I um, will tell you that. And um, and uh, currently married to a woman. I'm absolutely mad about the FM3. But, um, but I will say this. This, this was a, uh, I had been on the road for a while doing things. And, and, uh, and my ex did not for that very much and you know eventually I did settle back down and, but what happened was is that one particular night after I came home after being on the road for a little while I have this red custom strap that I still have to this day and uh, I refer to the guitar as baby because what happened one night when I came home the guitar was actually put in our bed with Sleep with your baby now, you, 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 whatever. So it was kind of like the running joke. And people really don't know why. I say you're like one of the people I've ever told that story to you about the guitar. Oh my and, God, that's uh, so, great. So, so, there's, so there's, there's, there's a reason why that guitar is called Baby. So. And, well, now uh, we know. And, and when I hear yeah. it again, I go back and hear it again. I want to hear it with a different yeah. perspective, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And it's going to be like, oh, um, now I know what that story is for sure. There's no mistake. <laughs> As far as people know about me or my music or whatever, you know, I have a, a very good audience here in the Midwest where I'm from, and I, I could probably play forever and never, never have to leave the Midwest. But over the years, I have done small segmented tours. I've even been to, you know, England. And, uh, and but I mean, like, in short trips like I've had before where I played like the Gat Flat. Gas Lamp District and a couple places in Hard Rock and then a place called The Stage in San Diego and Santa Monica 
and a couple small places in LA. Open on action art, and then uh, uh, as of my you know, not too recent past. Now you're going to be going on on tour again here real soon, though, because you you also have I mean you do have the uh, individual music out, but one of these uh, CDs is a is a recent release, correct? You have a new CD out right now. Yeah, it's uh, the one that's out now. Even though I'm currently working on my fourth uh, solo CD right now, as we speak, I'm trying to you know, put it together in the studio. Um, I just released. I, I, I believe you got to keep pumping them out because otherwise you got to keep it fresh for your audience. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, but the recent release called uh, Leaving Profits Town, and uh, it's been out since November and doing well. And, uh, and you know, it's Leaving Profits Town or Profit Town? Uh, Profits Town. Oh. And, I, and, and actually, in western Illinois, there really is a city called Profits Town. Oh, but wow. The meaning be- but the meaning behind that phrase uh, if you listen to the lyrics of it, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. Uh, is that would be wonderful. Really talking about uh, being in a city that just is so you know caught in in the Stone Age, and everybody's a prophet. Everybody tells you how to live their life, how to live your life, the things to do. You know what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. But, uh, everybody else, won't, yeah, everybody but, has it. But they keep doing the same thing they're doing, stuck in the same hole that they'll be in forever. So I made it my, if you, uh, like one of the lyric lines, well, my home, the wrong side of the city, in a town that had no pity, no reason to stay, nothing left here anyway. So. Oh, I like that. Really, yeah, and uh, so it really kind of points out that, you know, sometimes you can be so caught up in a world that you never escape because you really don't even know that you're trapped. Yes, I could see that yeah. easily. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's it's done quite well. But it was uh, also uh, one of uh, I, I consider these things to be accomplished. And as each album gets done, um, I'm able to draw the attention of other major artists who have performed on my albums. So uh, this one, this particular album, the third album, Leaving Prophets Town, had uh, uh, Leland Squire play bass. Who is uh, James Taylor's longtime, you know, um, bass player? Uh, wow! But Leland Squire, he's like he's on over three thousand albums. He plays for he's on tour with Toto oh. right now. Oh my goodness! Yeah, wow. and, but but he uh, you know he played Jackson Brown and you know, all the early Motown stuff. He was part of a famous group of studio guys called the Wrecking Crew uh, that was very famous in in the LA area. So. I feel very blessed to have guys like him as be part of this. And oh yeah, definitely. I mean, what 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 an incredible so, influence to to be working he, with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and he did it. He did it based on what he believed, and he believed in the song because it was it was a choice he made. It wasn't my choice. It was a choice that I yes, I asked him, but he wanted to do it, and he did it. And I am forever grateful to him. And I I, I hope he hears this because he certainly I I can never thank him enough for his wonderful contribution, but. Also, I work with uh, Tim McDonald, who is uh, Tim McGraw's piano player in Nashville, and uh, and he also is on the show Nashville, which is on ABC. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do watch. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, and so he's quite accomplished, very accomplished, great guy, um, a real talent. Uh, just once again, just one of those people blessed to have him on there, and the other. Fellow that was on this one too is Eric Scott, who lives in California as well. Oh yeah, we we did touch base. I remember uh, before yeah, we did yeah. touch base about that. Right. Well, I mean, uh, you know, another bass player who worked with Sonia Dada and and uh, a lot of a lot of soundtrack stuff. He did, what was the new movie? Was it called Pan? The Peter Pan thing? Oh, there was yeah, there was a brand new one recently. Yeah, uh, kind of I think it was just called Pan. I think it was just Pan on the yeah, list. and it's Correct. sort of like a futuristic version of Peter Pan. Yeah, yeah, a little yeah, it's, it's anyway, a little different than the did, traditional. <laughs> yeah, Eric, Eric did a lot of the soundtrack for that. Oh wow, that's so, wonderful. So, you know, I, I mean, as I keep spreading my wings, and you know, I've had Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers, and he certainly has his own brilliant career. Who has better, yeah. <laughs> that said some wonderful things about the music. So I know that things are opening doors for me, and I'm getting more and more people who are in the know or in the, the at, you know, at the top of the heap, so to speak. Yeah, They're yeah. And some recognition, and, and so 
I, once again, I hate to keep using the word blessed because that's all, the only thing I can really say is because to have these people give me this type of acknowledgement and even be part of the stuff with me is just mind-blowing. Oh, God, this is just amazing. I mean, just listening to you and, you know, I mean, I know you've worked with a lot of different people in the industry, but, I mean, just listening to all the information is like it is mind-blowing and it's amazing that you do have these influences around you and working with you and, you know, giving good feedback with you, you know. And but at the same time, I mean, I, you, you know, most people don't brag on themselves, and I really don't want you to take away, you know, for the fact that you really, truly, I feel you do belong in that same category. Because, again, I've been listening and watching and studying up and, you know, and just like I'm truly amazed. I, like, I would have no problem sitting in a lounge somewhere for three, four hours just listening to you nonstop. You know, I mean, I really do feel that you're very much in that same category. So you really do, um, I mean, you really should give yourself credit in that and um, just everything that you have done. And I know the fact that you're working on your fourth solo now. You just released the third one. And I know, like, you're going to be working in Nashville here pretty soon. You're going to be recording in Nashville, and then you're going to hit uh, four. Um, actually, the all over the place. Is, yeah, the first stop is actually going to be, I'm going to do a couple of cities out in uh, Washington State. Oh, okay, Washington first, then Nashville. Yeah, and then uh, and and then I'm going to go to Nashville probably the latter part of June uh, to record probably about half of the new album in the Pro Studio down there with the uh, Nashville session guys and the guy. Wonderful. So, and this is what you're working on now in your in your home yeah. studio, and right. it's a kind of like take over there to to complete it. Right. Basically, when you when you're in your own home studio, and you know, and like everybody, almost anybody who's in this industry at this level has a, a home studio where they can at least track down all my albums. I've played my own drums, my own guitar, do all my own vocals, solos for the most part, and then I have to bring in other people, like keyboard players, bass players, horn players, harmonica players. Oh, okay. Okay. Singer, so, but but so I can lay out a basic kind of uh, song uh, structure here, and it will give all of them a really good idea of, you know, primarily how I want it to go at the other end. So, uh, well, that's great. Uh, and, and where can fans yeah. now? Where can fans see you, your music? Where can like, what are your social media sites where fans can go and check out your music? And we're talking about now. You might have people going, you know what? I want to go hear this right now. You know, and um, well, uh, you know, the whole thing. There's a couple different sources and. Uh, but the first one, obviously, is my website, which is www.larrywimmer.com. And, of course, Facebook is, you know, you can just type my name in on Facebook and they'll find me there. They can find my music page there as well. Um, I My music is available on all of my albums on iTunes, at Amazon, CD Baby. Uh, so they're capable of listening to and or buying from there. Okay. And the last but not least, but I and and, and the only reason why I, I almost hate to say this, but basically, uh, if you just Google my name uh, uh, and you go down the line, there literally will be, uh, you know, the, I don't know if you know this or not, but most artists have all a lot of their songs if they're registered with All Music and BMI and they're in all you know, like Rovi, which is this nationwide network where you load up your music and stuff and in this platform because I'm, you know I'm, I'm also I'm also a Neris member, which is a member of the Grammy Association. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. So Sorry, it, I'm definitely you know, learning. <laughs> yeah, so um, what that allows for is for your uh, music to be nominated for awards, but also when people go to look for you, like it automatically because of what they did with my albums, uh, you will. They will sh- you can listen to almost virtually any of my songs completely all the way through on YouTube because they do the same with it. They don't, it's not like a video where I'm, they're showing me running around, you know, on train tracks or, you know, whatever, standing there. Yeah, a lot of the most ones. That- picture of the album cover in the background, a highlighted picture of me in the corner, and then plays my song. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the live versions, though. I really, I, I prefer myself to see those live videos. I think that's absolutely amazing because then you really do get that feel of you truly playing it and, and seeing you into it, immersed in your music and in your art and what you want to convey to, to the people out there and, you know, just the love of this and, and the, you know, the soulfulness of it. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. I really liked seeing that you had more 
live, um, you know, versions out there than, you know, like you said, on train track somewhere or, you know, or in a room somewhere or something like that, like a lot of the videos and stuff. I thought the live version yeah. was wonderful. Contrived, they call it, you know, contrived video. Yes, there was absolutely. Yeah, like but I said, I, I but, couldn't you know, stop watching uh, Up. <laughs> yeah, and then the thing is, is that, you know, and what it, and, and, you know, being a little older as an artist, um, I, uh, like I said, I great, did a great deal of mentoring and working with other people here in the Midwest. More so, early in the career, it was with a lot of bigger bands, but uh, in the last 10 or 12 years, when I've been really the most serious, even in my own career, solo-wise, uh, I've worked with people like Terry Spitzer, who was a local guy, with a lot of wonderful albums, and I I, I performed uh, on that album with him. It was an album called Wood and Wire. Uh, and uh, there's a, uh, also a, a local girl who's a fabulous singer, Leah Stilson. And it's a, her uh, one album she has. I was just subtitled. It's called Leah Stilson. And um, so helping a lot of younger bands. There's a band called The Final Run, which is sort of a an emo band that I work with, you know, in a sort of an advisory capacity. And uh, they they get a sort of a lull for a while, but they're starting to come out and hit it. But uh, but I just you know I mentor to anybody that I can if I if if they need me or whatever. And I have always given of my time since forever uh, when people needed me in any capacity, whether it was guitar or drums or vocal or whatever I could contribute. I've always worked on every other project for absolutely free. But well, you're, you're still kind of doing that for them now. I mean, you're still promoting them yeah. and talking about them and mentoring them yeah. as we speak now. We're, you know, calling you to talk about yeah. your work and everything, and, you know, so people can get to know a bit more, more about you and, and your music, and you're still mentoring and promoting other people and their music, which is wonderful. It shows what a good-hearted person you are and, you know, that everything you say is sincere and you take it to heart and you take that influences and those connections and stuff really to heart, and it, and it, and it shows that you appreciate it you know, for, you know, for doing that, you know, and again, I don't want people to take away of the fact that, you know, you're truly amazing yourself, and I really would like people to check you out, so yeah, you know, everybody, please just Google Larry Wimmer, you know, go on his site, check out his music, I've been doing all of that, you know, something I definitely recommend, it's absolutely wonderful, you know, and, and you really have had a lot of connections, you know, with so many different people, you have some wonderful stories, so, I think that's wonderful. Storytelling on stage to music is definitely, you know, your skill. You know, something definitely that I really enjoy. Um, okay, well, I mean, is there, like, anything else, though, that you would also like, you know, the fans to know about before we, you know? Uh, well, before I do, I, I, can I just give a shout-out for a couple of yeah. people? With the, of course you can. I, 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 you know, uh, there's a fella who lives in Nashville who was at one point, and he, he was, like, my biggest um cheerleader for a while and he's sort of like somebody retired in the business itself but uh, in, in the day he managed bands like Leonard Skinner and and and, and has become one of the patriarchs in Nashville uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Kinnaman and it's like the word cinnamon but spelled with a K to start so I want people to know about this guy and, you know and know who he is because he has given me absolutely free Sage advice. Uh, uh, it's almost like a father figure to me in Nashville. And there's not a person who there would say a bad word, but it is because of his persistence in kind of dogging me to get certain things done and push forward that uh, the other guy owe a great deal. And I, I feel like I would do a disservice if I didn't give him as much credit for me being where I am as a writer or as a performer at, or you know, as or pursuing a career, uh, no one is more responsible for me doing that than him. So, wow. shout out for him. Wow, that's and, a wonderful uh, shout out too. It's definitely and a great the other, And the other is uh, a friend of mine from Nashville, a uh, guitar player that came over from Russia uh, the better part of like uh, 12, 14 years ago with this band called Baron Strait, um, who was one of the top session guitars in Nashville. And the guy you know, works every day in the studios in Nashville. And just to let you know that successful people uh, are some of the pe best people on the planet. And there's a lot of jerks out there. But a guy who has always remained humble 
kind to everyone in the industry down there and has helped in many conversations to give me the straight skinny on everything that's going on uh, in the music world. Uh, and and that was for him. So his name is Ilya Tashinsky, and I think people should look him up. Uh, and check him out, too. And uh, that's about it as far as that goes. But as, uh, as far as anything else, I just want to say I just... I just uh, I love when uh, I get a chance to uh, really tell people what I'm really trying to do, and it's not some contrived thing that I'm really trying to put a message out there through my music. And uh, yeah, it's not a mainstream what you hear every day type of thing. Yeah, yeah, you definitely definitely put a lot. Yeah, and if I change a few people in the world, if I can really, because there's an old saying, if you can change one person in the world, you change the so. Um, I totally believe that. So I guess well, I can pretty much leave it there. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean that's that's an awful lot. I mean you you really have you know seen that you have a lot of people in your life you know that you, you've really touched and that they've touched you and you've made a lot of connection and built a lot of friendships it seems you know and and yeah everything just but it all seems to work together with a great collaboration because again you know the music is amazing really wonderful and I was able to easily just immerse myself in it, you know, and I just thought that was great. So, yeah, so, again, you know, um, I'm Billy Briggs with Center Stage Magazine, speaking with the multi-talented Larry Wimmer. And if you just go check out his site, you can just Google his name. You can go to Facebook, you know, and um, find, you know, different sites there. And, yeah, please make sure to check out all the people that Larry has mentioned. It's a little too many for me to be able to shout out all the names you mentioned. But, you know, check out the people that he's, you know, asked you to check out as well. You know, he won't steer you wrong. If it has anything to do with the influence of the music that you make, then I would definitely go and check it out because I'm already hooked on what I've heard from you. So I think that's wonderful. And I appreciate the time that you've, you've taken to giving us this opportunity to speak with you. And I know you're busy and you've got a lot of things going on. So it was absolutely wonderful for you to take your time out and do this for me. And on just a personal little note, this interview was supposed to happen yesterday. I had a bit of a personal emergency, and I was able to call you and let you know that. And I appreciate the fact that we were able to reschedule this for today instead. And I really, really do appreciate the fact because that was something that was on a personal level instead of just having another journalist call you to go ahead and do it. You were so kind to say, you know what, no, it's okay. We'll wait another day. We can do it together. So on just a personal note, Thank you so much. That meant a lot to me, you well, know, and as, as a person. That, you know, we 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 share a uh, we share a common uh, thread um, with what you were going through yesterday, and I and it's always been a big thing of mine is, is that this this is wonderful what you're doing for me or and for everybody that you interview and the publicity that it brings and you know the comments and and that, but uh, I never forget the bigger picture. And, and, I, and I, I've always put family first, and I've canceled many an event and uh, and many an excursion. Yeah, I was I was a little I was a little nervous, and you know I I did let the you know my bosses kind of know and everything, but the fact yeah. that so kind to say you know it's okay you know we'll do this you know tomorrow instead, and that was absolutely wonderful because I mean you have such a busy schedule, and I know I mean just. All the people that you've worked with and all the things that you have going on, you know, to be able to say, you know what, no, I'll just go ahead and make it convenient for somebody else was just amazing to me. And I was floored and I was just like, I was touched that, that, that you were like okay with that when I know that you are such a busy person, you know, and it just it was something that just came up and I was willing to give it to somebody else, you know, and everything like that, you know, but, but I was just really Lord, and I appreciated that you did that. So thank you so much, Larry. I mean, that really does speak a lot about your character and what a good person you are, what a good-hearted person, you know, you are. At least that that's the feel that I got, you know, and that's what I'm going to stick with. So this is Billy Briggs, and I'm with Center Stage Magazine, and I encourage you to check out Larry, Larry Wimmer with his Funkadilly sound. And um, maybe we can check in with you later on down the line once you are uh, got your tour going, and maybe we can kind of help put out the tour dates and just trying to give a reminder on the magazine for fans to pitch you. Anytime. Anytime right. I can help or whatever, whatever you need. I, uh, when I can be there, I will. Awesome. And thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Oh, I, I appreciate it to you so much. Thank you so much, Larry, and we will talk to you later. And, again, check out Larry Wimmer, and we'll, talk to, we'll catch in with him later on. 
You have a good day, Larry. I will. Thank you. Same to you all. Bye-bye.